No one needs to tell us that drug addiction is an enormous problem in Australia, New Zealand and around the world. 38% of Australians aged 14 years and older have used illicit drugs. 88% of our youth who have been arrested by the law had used illicit drugs in the six months before their arrest. The situation is similar in New Zealand. Drug abuse makes our streets ever more dangerous. It wreaks havoc among families. It ruins human lives. We've heard a great deal about the problem, but today we're going to hear the gripping experiences of two very different people who've overcome the challenges of drug addiction. We're going to find out just what can help people who seem hopelessly trapped in drug abuse. There's something out there even more powerful than heroin or cocaine. I spoke first with Jamie, who overcame the challenges of hard drug addiction and is now using his experience to help others. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing hope around the globe. Jamie, welcome to our It Is Written program today. It's good to have you with us. I understand that you were addicted to hard drugs for over 10 years and now you're working with people who are struggling with addiction. How did you become involved with drugs? In high school, I, you know, at parties, I would drink with my friends and, um, and that was sort of pretty normal to do in, in school. Um, I, later on when I was around 15, I started experimenting with um, pot or marijuana and um, that progressed over the next few years to, um, to trying other drugs like speed and, um, and heroin when I was 17 and um, used that on and off, uh, both of those drugs on and off for the next 12 years or more. So it started off really, as many people would see as something fairly innocent, but you were setting yourself on a pathway that led to, to addiction with, with hard drugs. What is the reality of addiction? One day you're doing something for fun, you're having a party, and then um, before you know it, it's more something that you need to do and it's no longer what you would call fun. The withdrawal symptoms are, are highly unpleasant. You feel physically sick and um, you can't sleep and you basically need the drug just to feel normal after a fairly short time. So it becomes a, a, a struggle then to, to survive almost? Yeah. And, and the friends that you were associated with in, in taking these hard drugs, um, where are they today? What, do, have you maintained a relationship with them? Some of them I have. Some of them have moved on from that. Some, a, a, la a large portion of my close friends have died. Some have, um, have um, ended up in mental institutions. So these were friends that you were actually shooting up with? Yeah. And you say a number of them have died? Um, I've, I've really lost count, not that that's a, a large number, but just um, it's a bit depressing to actually think of. I've lost, as, as far as very close friends, people that I would consider even family. I, I lost seven or eight and, um, and I still get phone calls every year or so that another one, someone that I was close to has died or... So this, this becomes a life and death issue. Yeah. Now, Jamie, you were involved with hard drugs, you mentioned, for about 12 years. Uh, what brought you out of, of drug addiction? That, that was a process that lasted for a few years. I'd, I'd reached a, a breaking point, going through a really tough time. I was depressed and, um, and um, 
not eating and staying awake for days at a time. And um, my mum asked me to go see a friend of hers who um, worked with people with drugs and had a lot of experience with people that use drugs. So I went and spoke to him and um, and I suppose I knew he was a Christian and I, I had an idea in my mind that he would be judgmental and would be telling me how bad what I was doing was. But when I came to meet this man, he um, he really just accepted me and was friendly and just um, and didn't really bring up what what I was didn't really point out my faults as I thought he would. Now, this gave you a different perspective on Christians and, and Christianity. And what happened from there on? Well, that started to um, lead me to a, a turning point in my life where I really considered um, what I was doing and the impact it had on my family and friends and on myself. Um, I started really looking at the Bible and and I'm um, reading about Jesus and and just um, it became a a constant dissatisfaction to to myself that I wasn't doing the best that I could do and um, and that I wasn't getting what I what I what hoped that I was getting to begin with. Now, you were reaching a, a stage of your life where you were becoming depressed and, and really trying to work out just what, where, you, where you were going. I reached a point where I just couldn't continue with that lifestyle and I, I wasn't happy with myself and I had no sense of direction. And um, I just sort of didn't, didn't feel like I would amount to anything. But at that point, I felt this presence in my life, just in the room with me actually, um, really try, tried to um, speak with me, I guess. It was, um, it, um, it really made me feel a sense of, um, that someone was caring for me, something greater than me was actually had had concern for where I was going and something had a purpose for me that I didn't have for myself. So what happened next? At that point, I really, for the next few days, I struggled with my, I was still drinking and smoking cigarettes and I wasn't enjoying them, but I, I sort of got down to my last few cigarettes and um. It was drawing close to sunset one night and I was halfway through a cigarette and I just sort of went, I, I don't, didn't want to finish it. So I put it out and I went to, went to sleep that night and I, I think I, I prayed, I was speaking to this higher power. I, I wouldn't have called it praying at the time, it was more like a conversation. I was just like, I can't, I can't go on if you're there, if there's something there, I, I really need you to show me and the next day I woke up and there was a church around the corner from where I lived and I, I walked into the church and I picked up a Bible and um, I opened it and everything I was reading was really reiterating to me exactly how I felt and where I was going and it was talking about, um, about this struggle between my mind and my body and my my spirit and my and my um as the bible puts it the flesh and the desires of that let's let's look it up together shall we and just uh just have a look at it here so it was it was romans romans the chapter 7 and verse 15 well here it is notice this is this is what you read that day for what i am doing i do not understand for what i will to do that I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. I, I, thought, I thought this book, when I picked it up, would be telling me, you know, what I should be doing, not how I was feeling. And it, it really 
brought to my mind that these these feelings go they've been with humanity for a long time and and it really just I was amazed that this old book really could could explain to me um, exactly how I was feeling today in this modern age. And I re the Holy Spirit, I now know, really, really was speaking with me through that experience. I said, so if it's, if your will leads to life, well then my, my life has to go. So I, at that point, I said, look, I'm, I don't deserve heaven or whatever your your book talks about but um but i'm i'm willing to accept that your will is better than my will and and so therefore i put that choice in your hands because i couldn't make that choice myself what did your friends think of all this jamie they must have wondered what on earth had happened yeah i um i thought how am i going to explain this to my flatmates <laughs> and i when they came home, they sort of said, oh, oh how's your day? What, what have you been up to? And I just sort of said, and I didn't know how else to put this. It was, and I knew how corny it sounded. And I knew how I would laugh in the past when people had said, if I'd heard someone else say exactly what I was about to say. But I just said to them, I gave my life to Jesus Christ today. And, um, and they just sort of, dropped their jaw and sort of thought I was joking, but I, I just, they could see that something had changed. So Jamie, your life's been changed. What have you done with it since then? Well, since that time, I, um, I volunteered in a drop-in centre at Cabramatta where I met um, the man who gave me encouragement at that time. And I thought, I, I could probably do something like this. So I um, went back and studied for a few years and, um, and then volunteered for um, about six or seven months after that. And um, eventually, I, through looking for jobs, I found a job in a, um, a large um, hostel for homeless men in the in the King's Cross area, where um, where addiction is is um, a normal part of everyday life, and I I got that job, um, and I've been there for three three and a half or well, three years now, and um, I I work with men with addiction and um, run a group for for addictions. Um, and just help people daily try to make plans to overcome the struggles in their life. Well, how wonderful is that, that now you've dedicated your life to assisting people going through those struggles with addiction so that they too can experience the transformation, the change that you've had that's brought such meaning and purpose to your life. Jamie, what advice would you give to someone today who's watching this program and who's struggling with addiction? I would say no matter where you are in that struggle, there, there is hope that you will overcome that. Not to, not to let go of that hope or to focus too much on your, on your failures, but, but to know that um, there's a bigger plan for your life and that um, one day you will overcome that if you just hold on to that. Jamie, it's been a privilege to have you with us here on It Is Written Today and uh, to hear the wonderful experience, your life story, really, really how God has turned your life around. And uh, we wish you God's richest blessing as you represent Him to people who are struggling and you assist those people to turn their lives around. Again, it's been wonderful to have you with us today, Jamie. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've heard the inspiring story of how Jamie overcame drug addiction. Now let's hear from the mother of a drug user. I spoke with Margaret Mackay to find out how drug addiction affects families and what family members can do to find hope. 
Margaret, welcome to It Is Written. It's a pleasure to have you on the program today. Margaret, you've experienced drug addiction firsthand in a family situation. You've experienced the anguish, the tragedy. Tell us a little about your experience. Well, my eldest son, David, um, became a drug addict or started on drugs, um, tobacco, then alcohol, then marijuana, the usual pattern, about 12. He was, you know, my first, my precious little boy uh, that I thought would never do anything wrong. And um, it progressed to um, the uh, harder drugs, heroin, uh, speed, uh, prescription, you name it. He became a chronic poly drug addict. That means he took many, many drugs. And, and how did that affect you and the family? Well, it was horrendous, affected us all. Um, one of the worst things is the shame, um, because back then, um, in the early 80s and 90s, no one talked about it, and it wasn't out in the open. So to have a child addicted on drugs, you then necessarily had to be a bad parent. That's what people thought, it was your fault. Mm. So it was shame, uh, covering up, um, yelling and screaming sometimes in frustration, just getting nowhere. It, it, there was just no help, nowhere to go. You were just all alone. And what was the, the story? What actually happened? Well, he, um, he wasn't able to hold down a job. He just, his addiction was a disease and it just progressed. And it went for 17 years and 12 to when he finally died at 29. But um, he was a really chronic drug addict and to go through all those stages with him was, you know, he had, there was a peri short period in jail, many times in rehabs at home, broken relationships, um, and trouble all the time. It's just torture to watch your child, especially he was so intelligent. He had an incredible future. He had the most incredible wit, um, sense of humour, a beautiful, beautiful person, but just ruined, totally a life ruined through drugs. What was the, what was the final outcome of the situation? He just got so bad. He ended up down 42 kilos, anorexic, dehydrated, hadn't had a proper meal for eight months. Um, the drugs just took over his whole body. It was cannibalising. We managed, I managed to get him help uh, into a hospital and he, um, we flew him to the a rehab for almost a year and he came good for a short time and then went down into the country um, south and started a new life. But he had one little hiccup and, of course, he went back to where he'd always been he didn't know how to cope, so he went back to his drugs, went to a doctor, got methadone and took it and on the Monday night, died instantly and wasn't found till the Friday night, decomposed by then. How did you deal with co and cope with this, this unfolding tragedy in your home? It's hard to explain. I, ne I never forget the feeling of when I was told he'd die. And uh, you're numb for so long. I think I cried for three months. I couldn't go to school. I couldn't teach. I, I was just totally numb. And um, I got very angry and I sort of started trying to do something about it because I knew there was nothing I hadn't done to try and help him. But the system had failed, so I went out to try and do something so others, you know, wouldn't have to go through it, to try and bring it out in the open so people would have to deal with it. And you really did a wonderful job in, in this regard. Tell us a little about what you did and how you set up the program. Well, I, I wanted to run a public meeting, but I didn't have a computer or a typewriter. I didn't even know what a media release was or a flyer. I'd never had anything to do with that and a man helped me a little bit and our first public meeting brought 1,200 people, standing room only, 
they were experiencing similar challenges in their own lives, in their own communities, in their own families. Yes, and so people were just desperate and because it had never been brought out in the open and so here we brought it out in the open. Now, further than that, you also were responsible for establishing a centre that would assist young people who were struggling with an addiction. Tell us a little about that. Well, when I was in Sweden, I saw their brilliant Hassler programs. I had never seen anything so fantastic with um, over 90% success rate even 12 years later. And I thought, why shouldn't the Australian children have access to that? Why just the Swedish ones? And so I had managed to get $300 towards some sort of program and I needed a million dollars. So I came home to Australia and we're having a meeting four days later to decide which way to go. So I got a friend to pray with me every day if this was God's will for my life, he would touch someone's heart and they'd give me a million dollars. That's a lot of money. I never thought anyone, you know, maybe a few hundred to start with. And on the last day, four hours before the meeting, the phone rang and a total stranger from Sydney who knew nothing about drugs, had no children, wasn't a Christian, um, he quizzed me and he said, how much money do you need for your program? And I said, oh, probably a million dollars. And he said, I'll give you a million. And I was stunned and I said, why, why? And he said, my heart was touched with David's story, exactly as I'd prayed. Margaret, if you were to share some advice to parents who may be watching today, who perhaps have children who are also struggling with addiction, what advice would you give them? Well, number one is to take off their mask, stop pretending nothing's happened, and to go for help, a self-help program that's zero tolerance. Um, if you look up the phone books, there's Naranon in some towns and Alanon, and they are for the families of addicts. And you, there you will meet people who are going through the same thing, totally anonymous, um, who understand what you're going through. And they give you the courage and also your faith in God. Um, and you're able to put that into practice, but you must, must go for help. Um, you can only help the addict by changing your behaviour. And the results in America show if the parent or the one closest goes for help, the addict has 50% better chance. And do something about it. They say to do nothing is the worst choice you can make. Margaret, we really appreciate you coming and sharing with us today. We appreciate the time that you've given. We respect and admire the, the wonderful work that you've done to help others who are struggling with, with addictions. And we want to take this opportunity to wish you all the best as you continue to work with young people. Thank you very much. Let me ask you, have you struggled with a particularly stubborn habit in your life? Are you struggling right now with some problem that just won't go away? Have you been defeated over and over again by some kind of addictive behaviour? You may never have become addicted to drugs, but there are many other things that we can become addicted to. Jesus Christ has a special skill in helping people overcome addiction. Maybe the claims that people make about Jesus Christ seem like so much advertising, so much propaganda. Sometimes Jesus saves is just another cliche. Sometimes it's hard to imagine this working in your life because you've failed so many times. But I want to leave you with hope today I want to leave you with something that you can hang on to. Listen to what Jesus himself tells us in John chapter 16 and verse 33. Listen to the power of Christ that is so evidently revealed here. The scripture says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. That's the good news that Jesus brings us. We may feel that a certain addiction is bigger than us. 
We may feel that it's stronger than us. We may feel that our resources are completely gone. But there's someone willing to step in and give us victory and peace. There's someone who has overcome every single thing the world can throw at us. Remember, there's nothing that can strike you that Jesus hasn't overcome. I've seen it over and over again. I've witnessed it in countries all over the world. People who are delivered from hardcore addiction point to one thing, one person who got them through, Jesus Christ. No matter how many times you've failed, no matter how powerless or helpless or hopeless you feel, the power of Jesus Christ hasn't changed. He's able to contend with anything that contends with you. Please give Him that opportunity right now as we pray. Dear Father, we come to You with our weaknesses, our failures. We come to You with addictions that we've tried to keep secret for so long. We don't have the ability to overcome on our own, but we claim Jesus as our friend. We want Jesus Christ standing by our side. So we place ourselves in His capable hands right now. We trust in Him as our Saviour and as our Lord. Amen. Until next week, remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. <laughs>